Welcome back, T3485, part two, turret and interior. Now the turret, of course, big difference between this and the earlier model uh, to accommodate the larger gun, also meant you had a three-man crew. This was great, the TC could actually spend his time commanding the tank, not having to do multiple duty. Now initially, T-3485 turrets had about 75 millimeters of armor on the front and were 52 on the side and rear. However, later models, by the end of 1944, you're starting looking at about 90 millimeters at the front and 75 sides and rear. The turret was of cast construction, although the roof was a simple flat sheet of metal which got welded in place. TC, of course, has his own cupola now. It's a fixed cupola, the vision ports are fixed, so you can't rotate them around, but he can rotate the roof with the hat. So by lifting up on the lever here, it's on rollers, it rotates fairly simply. Now the hatch itself, as I lock this back into place, very simple one piece. It's locked in place by a, a simple locking latch, and there is a torsion bar spring to help lift it open. That's the outside, let's go in. Now, commander's seat is not really the most comfortable I've ever been in. It's actually a good incentive for you to fight with your head out. Now, for reasons which elude me, it seems that TC has a choice of two different foot pedals. The first one is below the gunner seat. In order to get it to fold down, you have to lift up the gunner seat to give it room. You can then let the gunner seat fold down. Now, with this set of foot pedals, uh, he's aiming pretty much his legs in a forward direction, so he's quite comfortable. The downside, though, is that with his knees lower down, he's more risk of hitting the gunner in the back. Uh, the other set of foot rest, uh, which is part of the gunner seat itself, the advantage now is my knees have been lifted up. I'm not quite as intruding into the gunner space. The downside though is now my legs are angled over at 40 degrees and so I'm fighting with my body twisted and it doesn't strike me as being particularly comfortable for any uh, length or duration. To see out, uh, TC's not doing too badly. He's got five of these individual vision ports around here, which if it looks like you're taking fire, you can actually pull down and that will protect the port. To his front, he has a binocular or unity sight which is adjustable in elevation and, in theory, traverse, although this one's a little bit stiff. He doesn't have any other controls. Uh, he's along for the ride, no TC's override. Um, he's got some stowage facilities around him, so it looks a little bit sparse, but otherwise, his job is quite simply command the tank. Probably a nice relief for T-34 commanders that used to have to do multiple duty in earlier versions of the tank. Um, other than that, but the only thing I can say is, if I've got no gunner, I can stretch my legs out and I can still actually control the tank turret and get her around. Not really a three-man crew because we've got no sight, but it's comfortable. The better way, of course, to control the gun is from the gunner seat, so that's where I'll go next. Always easy. All right, so this is an example of elegance in operation. It's a crude tank, but it can also be elegant. So you sit in here, you go, well, where is the control for the power traverse? Because obviously you've got manual traverse, you have manual elevation, where is power traverse? Because ordinarily, you're in a separate set of controls. Well, no, not in this, they save space. All you do is you move the manual control to the top left, pull out the handle, and you're now in a power traverse mode. It's not precise, but it's a lot faster than cranking. So if I try spinning to the right, power! All right, so similarly going back, again, note how there is momentum in the turret, how it continues to spin even after I go back to the zero position. So this is purely a case of traversing quickly to get roughly on target. more or less straight, then you go back to manual mode and that's how you conduct your final lay and service the target that way. And again, you saw how fast this thing spins. Being a loader, holding that big 85 millimeter round as the turret is spinning around unpredictably, of course, because you don't control it, 
you want to pay attention. To engage a target, the gunner is supposed to have a TSH-15 sight. As you can see, somewhat missing. It did have an electrical light bulb, so it had an illuminated reticle for firing at night. And by January of 45, it also came with a heater to prevent from fogging. His primary toy is the S53 85mm cannon. 54.6 calibers in length, and he has 56 rounds to play with. Maximum service range, 5,200 meters. The gun has two ways of firing, electrical or manual. The electrical trigger is located on the elevation handle. The manual trigger is located next to the solenoid here. It would be a string that you pull and that will release the firing pin. Just behind the solenoid and manual firing trigger is an elevation quadrant. You can use this to engage targets at night if you're firing from a range card, for example, so you can actually see the target, you know what the range is. Uh, or alternatively, perhaps for indirect fire, although without an azimuth indicator, uh, at least not a precise one, I'm not entirely sure how that would be performed. There is a basic azimuth indicator on the left-hand side. It's a simple pointer. There is a graduated scale on the inside of the turret ring. That'll give you an approximate idea of what way you're facing compared to the hull. To his front, he has the selectors for the main gun and the coaxial machine gun. And curiously, you can have them both on or both off at the same time. I'm not entirely sure that's the way it's supposed to work. So we'll have main on and coax off. The coaxial is a 7.62 millimeter DT, and he has over 1,800 rounds of ammunition to play with in drums. To his left, he has a pistol port. There's another one on the other side of the turret. You unscrew it, bring it down, you can then push out the port plug. Engage targets with what was usually revolver. It was preferred by the tankers over the semi-auto, apparently. And just pull it back in, lock it in place, off you go. Last thing on the right hand side, this is a recoil guard with a traveling position. So the release latch would be here, unfortunately it's locked in place, I can't release it to demonstrate going up and down. Uh, however, suffice to say, it can theoretically be done. Last thing I say for the gunner is he doesn't have a footrest of his own, but since he is in control of when the turret traverses, it's probably less critical. That's the gunner side, loader next. Now we're over on the loader side and this is where things start getting a little bit nasty. Uh, for starters, of course, there is no turret basket, so I'm standing on ammunition boxes which are on the whole floor, so I've got to be careful as uh, I'm wandering around inside the tank. I've seen the turret on this thing move under electrical power. It is actually very fast, uh, which also means you have a tripping and leg cutting off hazard for the loader. Now it is possible for the loader to have a loader seat. However, I've never ever seen a loader sit on a loader seat when performing the loading operation. It's usually more for, uh, for road marches and trip long distance traveling. Uh, so perhaps this is why it isn't in this particular tank. Perhaps the loader just got sick of it being in the way. He has enough problems of his own to deal with. Now, as you can see, I'm... Let me stand up and you can see how little room I have to stand. So, that shows you where the floor is and what sort of an angle my legs are on right now. So, yes, I know I'm taller than most people. A foot isn't in the difference though. It's, it takes more than a foot in the difference to do this. So you have to be particularly short to work on this. The ammunition, as you can see, is not particularly short. 85 millimeter, of course, much stronger than the earlier one. So as I insert the round in, it's not gonna go all the way because the breech has been welded up. But you can see how the back of the round rests on the spring-loaded deflector. That's actually a relatively neat little thing here. What it'll do is it'll uh, take some of the weight of the long round and make it easier for the loader with his left hand, his weak hand usually, to throw the round in without also having to support its weight. Of course, it springs up out of the way to let the empty shell casing fall to the floor where the loader can then trip over it. Loader does have another periscope of his own. It's, uh, of course, adjustable in elevation and rotation. Forward of that is a dome light on the turret roof mounted over the machine gun, which I have to say is rather convenient if you want to change ammo belts in the dark. The loader has 16 rounds of ready ammunition available to him. Four of them are on the turret wall behind him, and the other 12 are located in the bustle. The rest of the 60 rounds of 85 millimeter in the hull. Now unlike an American tank, which for example will have removable panels, which basically make a false floor, 
the T3045's ammunition boxes are stowed in the open, giving an uneven footing for the loader as he's attempting to navigate his way around inside. So the astute of you will notice that this sequence is actually filmed in a different tank on a different day. We had a small incident with a memory card and the turret monster. However, this is the bow gunner's position on the T-34, and I have to say this is rather miserable. Not because it is uncomfortable, which is my normal complaint about such things. In fairness, the seat actually is very nice. And you can see my, my leg is absolutely straight. I put both legs absolutely straight into the, into the bow of the tank. Now, what really concerns me more is the fact that he can't see a damn thing. Your only view of the outside world, except maybe the driver's hatch, is from this small little hole through which you shoot your DT machine gun. Outside of that, you can imagine the noise of battle and you have no idea what's coming at you. Or you, you just have the small little hole. And oh, by the way, what happens when you get hit? Uh, well, there is actually at my feet a very small escape hatch. Very small. Still, I was slightly bigger than Matilda's, I guess. Um, for his machine gun, he's got 22 drums uh, scattered around in double depth here, single here, and then there is a vertical row, and of course, you got one on the gun itself. Held in place by a very simple travel lock. Just unscrew it a little bit. And there you go, it's very solidly in place, so you almost don't need to put your shoulder up onto it. You certainly have no need for the uh, shoulder guard here. Radios, if mounted on uh, in the hull, would be in the front right corner here. However, uh, this particular tank has uh, moved the radio to the bustle. Outside of that, the only thing he's got to worry about is not getting in the way of the driver and the gear stick. Now, the other things I'll point out in here, firstly, the interior space is taken up rather heavily by the suspension units, you can see here and here. Now, this is the downside with the Christie design. In order to get that large range of travel, the large springs eat up a lot of your internal volume. So the interior space in here is a lot narrower than it would be on any other tank. Now, it's not entirely wasted, though, because if you have a look behind, you can see that there are fuel tanks in between the suspension struts uh, and oil tanks for the back. So not totally wasted, but still narrower than you, than you might like. The last thing in here, if you look at the very far right corner, uh, you can see one of the locking systems for the idler wheel. So again, if you're going to tension the track, you have to unlock it from inside here, adjust the tension on the outside, and then you lock it back into place. Outside of that, the only thing blocking his legs is the axle for the, uh, for the front road wheel. And the next stop is the driver's hole. All right, so moving into the driver's position, Definitely, uh, you can see my knees are up. Uh, this is more for the shorter people in the group. Uh, to see out, he's got two prisms to his direct front. And of course, the hatch will simply move up out of the way. It's uh, lifted by a large cylindrical spring here. So you undo the two locking levers, push forward, springs up, and it's held in place by use of a screw here. Make sure if we do it tightly enough. There you go, nice and secure, and we have a little bit more light. So, quick tour of the driver's station. My foot is now in the clutch. That's as far down as it goes. There is a service brake in the middle, and accelerator on the right. Steering, of course, controlled by the two tailors. Uh, these are also brakes. Now this is a two-stage steering system. You pull back to the first stage and all that happens is that the clutch disengages. You have power going to one track only. You pull back to the second stage and this now applies the brake on the inside. Now the disadvantage with this, and this is why you see it so jerky uh, when you see a T-34 turning, is that it's not very efficient on the power. Your tank will slow down as you're going around the curve. Advantage. It's very, very simple to build. Uh, it's also a little bit tiring uh, for the driver. So starting around on the left-hand side, this is the control valve for the high-pressure engine start system. Now there's two ways of starting this thing. You've got the standard electrical starter motor, or if for some reason that doesn't work, there is a compressed air system. Now the bottles for that are in the very bow of the tank. 
uh, release the lever, a blast of high pressure will come down, cycle the engine, it's a compression system so no electrics required, engine will to life and hopefully your alternator will then take over and you will have electrical power for the tank. The high pressure air is only filled uh, by mechanics, it's not repressurized by the system uh, and that's why it's not the primary means of, of starting. The last thing I'll mention in here is the fact that I can't help but notice that I am behind the turret main. Uh, so pretty much down to my midriff, uh, which means that the driver has probably got to be leaning forward at all times, otherwise he's going to have a serious issue of the turret traversing around and various large heavy metal components uh, interfacing with his head uh, with a lack of clearance. Uh, I don't know how much of a problem obviously this was in practice. I guess after the first couple of knocks you learned a couple of lessons. Um, however, it, I just pointed out something which kind of strikes me as a bit unfortunate. Right, so that's it for this little sequence. Uh, through the wizardry of editing, we're now gonna go back to our original location. All right, we're gonna have a crack at moving this thing. Uh, Startup process, of course, warm engine because uh, mechanics have been helping us a little bit, frankly, I've been practicing. So, Gear lever is in neutral, foot brake must be applied, and there's a reason for that, we'll come back to what I just learned. Press down on the clutch, handbrake, correction, hand accelerator, about halfway up, then it's pump, horn, that if we're going to starting, and uh, starter. So if all is well, let's see what happens. <laughs> Okay, we seem to be idling. Now to get her into first, you gotta put her in reverse. Hopefully I've done that. Take off the brake, just push down and release. And let's see what happens. A little bit of clanking, not bad. Barely touching the speedometer. And we'll come to a halt here. All right, so if I go back into neutral, I gotta put it into reverse again. Okay, so my gear stick says I'm in neutral. I let go of the clutch. I'm in neutral. Now to go, got to go backwards again, all the way forwards with the gear stick. Don't ask. I'll try both hands. Ow! It's a heavy clutch as well, by the way. Okay, reverse works. Okay, I'm now stopped, put it back into neutral. Not quite neutral, you gotta actually put it back in the first in order to totally disengage the gear. So now, in theory, if I let go... Try it again. Okay, I've disengaged the gear. Cut the hand throttle. And then set the parking brake. So what happened there was uh, when I pulled back into first gear to disengage from reverse, I went a little bit too far. 
I engaged first, I took my foot off the clutch, tank crept forward. So to do disengage from first, back into neutral, back just touching the reverse gear, should disengage first, came back into neutral again, let go of the clutch, and that was the end of that. And uh, that is why the foot brake has to be set before you start the engine because you don't know if the last gear was properly disengaged. The fact that you can turn or move the gear lever side to side has no bearing as to whether or not you're in gear or not, which is a little bit disconcerting. And the other thing which is a bit disconcerting, if you didn't notice, was just how much force it was taking me to push or pull into gear. Uh, not very relaxing. Still, an interesting educational experience. All right, so well, what little strength I have left in my left leg after holding down the clutch for so much, it, it's not a light clutch. I'm going to attempt to egress in the traditional manner out the driver's hole. I am told head first, chest up is the preferred technique. I'm not having my foot stuck. It's probably a good start. What the hell with the preferred technique? <sighs> okay, who put the steering lever in the way? Halfway there. <clears throat> As I almost fall off the front slope. Fortunately, the spare track links almost broke my fall. <sighs> you know, if the tank's on fire, I'm gonna get out the turret. Now the Russians are gonna hate me. I don't like this tank very much. Now don't get me wrong, I respect it immensely. As a strategic war-winning vehicle, this thing served the Red Army supremely. However, as a tanker, it strikes me very much that it was designed purely with the needs of the state in mind, and the needs of the crew really didn't get much of a look in. Now perhaps this is simply a cultural thing, but as a Western tanker, that concept doesn't sit well with me. Still, 35,000 of the things were made, and if you add to that the production run of the earlier T-34s, bringing us to nearly 80,000, that alone cements T-34's place in the annals of tank history. By the close of the war, the tank was starting to show its age a little bit, and indeed about 90% of anti-tank gun hits on the T-34 would penetrate the vehicle. However, the fact it was still a perfectly serviceable weapon at the end of the war is a testament to how good a fundamental design T-34 was back in 1940 at the beginning of the war. It was, however, a bit of an evolutionary dead end. A lot of the features which made T-34 seem so awesome at the beginning of the war, such as the Christie suspension, the strange drive system, uh, the all-around sloping armor, they were dispensed with in later Soviet tanks as well. It would continue on to see service throughout the world, widely exported, for many, many years. Now, it got to the point that uh, anybody with any me basic mechanical skills could keep this operating. There was a case in Hungary about 10 years ago. Some protesters found a T-34 as a monument. They fired it up and they used it to attack the police. Unfortunately, they forgot about some basic fundamentals of tank warfare. They left their supporting infantry behind and the police walked up to the tank and they lobbed tear gas down hatches, which they also forgot to close. So there is an example as to why it is important that crew training is just as much as a factor as the tank itself. That was T-34. I hope you found it somewhat amusing and informative. I'll see you on the next one. Now the Russians are gonna hate me. I don't like this tank very much. And as I say that, my producer is about to throw something at me. <laughs> Inside. Ow. Ah, cold. An access point here for one of the suspension. One of the, 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 the. There are 22 rounds. Okay, that was unexpected. 
So in order to do unit maintenance on that piece of suspension, oh, last line, it's always last line.